So we reach the river with a completely bizarre airball hand and a 4-bet pot under the gun versus hijack, a hand that we're not even supposed to have bet on the turn, but we have because we're a fish, and we get to the river and it's like, well, do we follow through? And, and I say yes, because giving up on pots feels disgusting, and who cares about theory? And GTO and exploitative play and all of these things when you can just like throw all your money in there and hope the villain falls, but he doesn't, he snaps you with aces, and then it's time to ask, was this just an awful play? Let's find out. Welcome guys, in this video I'm going to be going over four of the bluffs I've made in the biggest pots that I've played this week and some of them are going to be good, I hope, many of them are going to be bad, I'm sure of that but I'm going to give myself a score out of 10 for the bluffs, I'm going to be brutally honest with myself I'm going to consult the objective guru of Pile Solver and, and ask it what I did what, right and what I did wrong in theory I'm then going to talk a little bit about how things might go in practice here playing against humans and we'll try and get to the bottom of whether I'm just a complete moron and should have given up in all of these spots or whether any of these bluffs are actually justified. We're going to start off with a hand where I get completely crushed. Let's get into it. So this first hand starts out with us opening under the gun, getting 3-bet by a kind of unknown player in the hijack. He's running he's running 1916 over 780 hands on my HUD, which could mean that he's like a tighter, weaker player. It could just be sample size. This may well be a strong player watching this video like you know offended that I've just said he's a 1916 net or he could actually be a net I don't know but in any case for a bit who cares call and we go to jack five deuce so this is a board that is going to favor my range a lot the jack is going to be a big part of my bluffing range and the queens kings and aces in my preflop range are going to constitute a big powerful value region here so betting this spot a very high frequency for a small sizing we don't have to rush pot growth at this stack to pot ratio even when we're a bit um, deeper than normal, we are 155 deep here pre. So we go for a, a little bet with our raised 10 of spades and the four of hearts comes. In game, we then make this terrible turn bet, which is which is awful. The reason this bet is, it's not awful, but it's bad. The reason this bet is bad is that when you're out of position and your flop bet has been called, generally the world you're in deteriorates to like an unfavorable one for your range. When you're out of position in a world that's not that favorable for your range anymore, what happens is that you have to have certain standards about what hands you bet and what hands you don't bet when it comes to bluffing and what we're actually doing here is we're betting a hand that unblocks his continuing range unblocks shoves raises it does block ace jack of spades exactly and some jack 10 of spades if he got a bit loose pre but that's not even necessarily a great thing as jack 10 may fall by the river here and basically we are unblocking we're blocking pocket tens which is like a classic turn fold here call flop full turn it's a hand he doesn't even like to call turn with because he blocks our bluffs and then we end up just making this bet which is which is a slight EV loss according to the solver this is the bet that you shouldn't um, really make let me show you what it says so on the turn the solver thinks that big bets are preferable this is a really common thing when the flop is double the texture is double flush draw villain is going to have a very what we call merged range he's going to have a lot of very medium equity hands in his range namely draws pair plus draw flush draw that sort of thing. So here you could have like ace five, you could have clubs, you could have hearts. And so using a bigger bet is generally slightly preferred here. Like our value hands are gonna slightly prefer it, but I mean like it's basically just, it doesn't matter. So using a small bet here, like I did in game, isn't really the problem. That's not where the EV loss comes in. The EV loss for my hand comes in by choosing to bet with a hand here that basically should never basically be bluffed. Like if we go back to the flop, we can see that this hand is basically supposed to pure check the flop. So I'm probably simplifying to range betting the flop, betting everything. I don't mind that, but when we come to this turn, if I have got to the turn with this hand, ace 10 of diamonds or spades, you can see I'm just supposed to give up. And that's because it's going to block his folding range and unblock his continuance range and basically unblock his raising range. He does do a little bit of this pink color here as him raising if we do go small. So yeah, not really an ideal turn bet. We've already put ourselves in a bit of a precarious situation by having way, way too much air here. I don't even know if I rolled the dice on this one to see if I would do it optionally or whether I just bluffed with my eyes shut and just decided to be an aggro lunatic, probably the latter. So we've been an aggro lunatic. We've been called again. We've made it to the river, the nine of spades. And at this point, it's not so clear that I shouldn't just empty the clip. Like, I've already been a total baboon. So if you're going to be a baboon in a hand, you may as well just be a complete orangutan as well on the river. But the idea here, seriously, is that we don't block any clubs or hearts combos now. These are the ones that are that are going to be folding, right? You can imagine villain with a hand like ace, queen of clubs, ace, queen of hearts. We also don't block his calling range, which is going to be like mostly queens, jacks, and aces that have slow played pre we also block ace king of spades which is a hand that i think is supposed to call turn sometimes and then fold 
So the, block, the blocker properties of this hand are somewhat neutral to maybe slightly favourable just unblocking the flustras. We're probably supposed to follow through River here if we do get here with this hand, but I don't actually... Like, I can't even begin to imagine how much I'm overbluffing by arriving with this hand all the time like a complete lunatic. So basically, if you overbluff, you know, Villain can, in future, just start making lighter calls. He can call you down with his king in this spot. He can just do stuff that owns you. In reality, he's, it doesn't really matter. He's never folding this hand. This is a completely well-played hand by my opponent. And he could raise turn. He doesn't have to. And yeah, it looks like I've been totally owned. In reality, my river play is like actually, on principle, fine with this hand. But I've put myself in a situation where I've just gone nuts on the turn and lost control of my betting frequencies here. I'll just show you quickly what it says about the river. So if we do play like a baboon here and bet turn, we then reach the river in this weird node that doesn't really exist in the solver's mind um, because we're not supposed to bet this size anyway. But let's just say that we got here in the nine of spades came. And now we can sort of look at this proportionate to not exactly in our range, but just like we can look at these boxes proportionate to how often we have queens as opposed to other things. We're basically never meant to reach this node by being small, but the solver can still show us what it would look like. And you can see here that the, the EV here, the numbers for Ace-10 of diamonds and Ace-10 of spades are very positive, so we should be bluffing this hand if we did get here. So the river play is like quote unquote fine in EV terms, but we have reached the river with a completely like, like maniacal range. And that's sort of the problem here. We need to be more conscious in future that we can't just bluff whenever we have like an ounce of something on the turn out of position in four bet pots. We're not in favorable landscapes. We need to be a bit more selective and we need to like avoid bl bluffing these hands that A, don't have a lot going on and B, just block folds and unblock his continues and especially unblock his raises. So I give myself three out of 10 for this bluff because even though the solver approves of it on the river, the, the turn play is just too out of line for me to give it a better score than that. Okay, on to the next one. If you guys enjoy the way that I think and talk about the game as well as teach poker, you can check out carrotconnor.com. We have a store where we sell all kinds of educational products from solved preflop ranges accurate for the rake at the stakes that you play to an e-magazine called Pio vs Population which basically shows you how to exploit the opponents at your stakes for the leaks that they have as well as a few books including Poker Therapy, my mental game book. Check out my store and let me know what you think about the products. Hope you enjoy them. Let's get back to the action here. In this next hand we have Jack 9 of spades on the button. Go for an open here and face a 3 bet from I believe a regular in the small blind. A player that's looking like a reg may not be this. This three bet's a little on the small side, so it's hard to say for sure. I think when villain size is down here, this is the sort of hand that just becomes a very profitable call. There's two reasons for this. One, someone who sizes down is more likely to not be a winning player or a strong player in the pool and could well be a recreational. Secondly, I'm getting better at pot odds and will have a deeper SBR in which to use my position and just play a hand like Jack-9 that has a lot of nut potential. So I think overall this is just going to be a very easy call. We do go ahead and peel and the flop comes 10-8-4 with one spade giving us an open ender and a backdoor flush draw. Villain goes for a big C-bet, which is actually good. This could indicate that, again, he's a weaker player because regs love to go one-third, or it could indicate that he's a good reg that's put in some of the study and understands that 10 8 is a board where out of position does want to size up. And the reason that Small Blind wants to size up here in a three-bet pot is that the nut advantage is very prominent on a board like 10 8 4 2 tone. The overpairs are doing extremely well, and 10s and 8s are in his range also. So overall, quite a large nut advantage. My range, on the other hand, is more mediocre, more merged, and we'll just be doing a lot of calling here. There will not be much of a raise game plan against this big bet, and that's fine. On the Ace of Spades turn, I believe this is the very important one to check behind, in theory, and I think the reason for that is that this, this draw is just so good that the bet fold branch of the tree is just too horrific for me. If I build a sizing here, and it would be a big bet, because honestly, I wouldn't be betting thinly for value in this spot, I would really just be betting like ace, queen, ace, jack, plus something like that, two pair of sets for value and then bluffs. The problem is that the out of position player always has some kind of check jam range in these nodes and when that happens to a hand as live as jack nine of spades, say we bet 58 here and he shoves, it's going to be the worst spot in the world, basically our EV is going to get reduced to zero. Whether or not that's a call, I don't know, it's going to be really close. Whether we call or not, it doesn't really matter, our EV has been decimated and so this is the sort of hand that really wants to just preserve its equity and just check back and realise. I really hate the expression realise equity normally because it can be super redundant guys, it can mean absolutely nothing at all because every hand realises equity by checking behind right, but hands with this 
window of like very good but not robust enough equity to bet call profitably or really profitably. Again, I stress it, it doesn't matter whether your bet call makes you a tiny bit of money from the point of view of being shoved on or not. It's just bad to be shoved on. You need to go ahead and, and check this one back. So I'm pretty sure this turn check is fine. I've not looked at it yet. I do have a sim ready to go. On the river, villain goes for this block bet, like about quarter pot, which seems totally okay. Generally, the out-of-position player is going to want to have sizes like this because they're going to have thin value hands like ace x or something and we are going to want to do some raising do some calling do some folding with our hand we have very good blockers here the reason being that villain doesn't really have a lot of 9x that he's bluffing with here even if he had queen 9 pre like he's just made a straight so the nine of spades is never going to be like a bad blocker in this spot. Jack nine just made a pair and, you know, isn't going to be bluffing, although we block that anyway with our other card. But the point is that th these blockers are really good for continuing in some way. So in reality, call here is plus EV. The thing that puts me off call is just that I just don't know if this spot gets bluffed enough. I just feel that people are usually a bit too guilty of sizing up with their bluffs instead of going like this. So I'd imagine that this sort of bet size is kind of full of like pocket kings, ace x type hands, just stuff that's going to beat me, but stuff that I do expect to bet fold at a relatively high frequency. So I just launched this all in. Again, a little bit maniacal, but at least not completely out of control like the last hand. Billin has six seconds in his time bank here. He's obviously been presented with some tough decisions already in his session. He's running low on time. His seconds tick down. Six, five, four, three, two, one, and he's calls with no time left at all he just throws it in with kings catches my bluff superbly puts me to shame and i again walk away with my tail between my legs how bad is this one let's ask the guru pile solver is this okay in theory or have i lost my mind again so villain goes for this large c bet against this as you can see the raising range we can basically just forego it like not bother to to apply this here and just call everything our hand jack nine of spades is a very um trivial call not really much to say um about that the turn is the ace of spades villain checks which isn't something he's meant to do loads but you can have a check in range and as we see here it turns out that we can bet this hand as long as we don't bet big because betting big would create that kind of nightmare stack to pot ratio that i was worried about in my analysis there and in fact, I wouldn't be using a small bet in this spot. Like I just wouldn't be building one. I would be betting sort of ace jack plus and I can bet ace jack of diamonds big. So I just wouldn't bet with like an ace jack without a flush draw here. I would just bet ace king plus for, for value. Ace king suited is a hand I'm meant to have here apparently sometimes, but I never do because I forget that I'm meant to flat that occasionally. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then like two pair plus being like the heart of my value range here would be stuff like ace eight, ace 10 pocket eights and then bluffs like these low pocket pairs and various assortment of gutters and stuff like that so yeah i'm just playing a bigger sizing here therefore i think there is going to be an ev loss associated with betting this hand not a huge one not as bad as i thought actually so we, we could bet here it turns out that my my fears are a little bit unfounded about this one it, it does it, it doesn't ever big bet in practice here but it's mainly just like over betting that would start to lose a ton of ev apparently the big bet's not actually too bad and if you did get raised here, you're calling for a bit more EV than I thought. I thought it would be closer to zero than this, but we're calling for, for a bit of money. So I guess bet call isn't quite as horrible as it looks. Bet fold would be really horrible. But yeah, check back is still, I think, the main play with a hand like this. And in some of these spots, it can be really bad, actually, to, to play this way. So villain then blocks the river. This is a very good size for his range. His hand kings. It's really going to be dependent on his suit, whether he's allowed to, to bet here. But anyway, let's skip that for now. He does go ahead and bet. And you can see here, Jack-9 is one of my bluff raises. I'm meant to usually raise this and if not call it. I already explained that I didn't think that people were really choosing this sizing with their King-9 very often. They were just sizing up with their bluffs here. I'm not sure they're finding like sevens for a block bet here. I just feel like I'm not going to win often enough by calling. So I decided that raise was the best play. He is supposed to mix a little bit of call with kings it's a break even hand the fact that he timed down and then called means he's probably over defending this spot which means that in hindsight my bluff is bad but we don't really have hindsight i'm happy with this hand i think the thought process all the way through is pretty good although there were a bit of monsters under the bed about thinking turn betting turn was worse than it was i'm gonna give myself an 8 out of 10 for this hand i think this one is is all right pass marks for this one for sure okay in this next spot we have ace 10 of hearts i'm not actually going to solve this one and the reason I'm not going to solve it is it's a little bit weird um, in terms of some of the sizes that were actually used. So we actually go for, in this 4-bet pot, hijack versus under the gun. We 4-bet and he flats and 
we go for the small c bet this board is basically just going to be pure c bet there's not going to be much else going on here very very favorable for our range here this texture i don't think this raise is meant to be a thing i'm pretty sure in fact that it's not however i don't think it not being a thing is actually like a condemning kind of judgment because there's lots of stuff that you can do that solvers choose not to do and it doesn't mean that they're bad it just means that they're not chosen as the main line and I think this sort of sideline, if you want to call it that, using a chess opening analogy here, is actually all right. Like, raising with some bluffs and some king x here, I don't really see the problem. It's going to be totally fine. There's a bit of useful fold equity. If I fold like ace jack here, you know, he gets me to fold that. And he has king jack or king queen or something. He gets me to fold that ace. So it's, it's not like totally useless for him to do this. It is a bit offbeat and unstandard. But what I need to avoid doing is what a lot of people do who are not very versed in how poker theory works and they just know that it's not something that happens in a solver so they go this is bad this isn't a thing this is terrible and it doesn't really work that way just because your opponent's doing something that's not standard doesn't make it bad in any case i think ace 10 of hearts here i think we can play call only at this sbr i don't think we need to re deny much equity here and shove in a, on a board like king 4 4 so we call turn goes check check so I think at this point, I'm just going to start engaging with what I think humans are doing. I'm going to kind of leave the playbook behind a little bit in this very offbeat, rare node and think a bit about what I think is actually going on. I'm going to like switch my switch my brain on here a little bit. And I think what's going on is that Villain either has a hand like King Queen, Ace King, King Jack or something like that, that's sort of just thin value raising flop, or he has something like a bluff, like Queen Jack suited or Jack 10 suited or maybe like a rare combo of 10-9 suited or something like that, possibly even just like a some kind of ace-jack or ace-10 hand himself or something like that. So I'm not actually going to necessarily beat every bluff here. Some of his bluffs are ace-jack or ace-queen or something. I'm not sure about ace-queen, that seems a bit far up, but this is hijack versus under the gun, so ranges are very tight already, so ace-queen is not, not as far up as you might think in his range. I think we have to bluff here. I think our hand is like just right at the bottom of our range, effectively. And I think it's good to choose a small sizing in practice. Like we could just shove, okay, this is all we have left. But my thought process in game here was that if I had a king, I can't actually shove. I'm not getting called by anything worse than a king here. And my range therefore wants this sizing. And the good thing about this is that if he's really polarized to having a king, which never folds to any sizing or a bluff that's going to fold anyway, I don't really see why I need to use a bigger bet than this. And this goes back to something I teach in the Carrot Poker School. This is a grade two topic. And it's it's something called Clark's Theorem, which is like the only thing I've ever named after myself. I'm not so vain that I do this on a regular basis, I promise you. But Clark's Theorem basically says that when your opponent's range is getting kind of polarized, you should use a smaller bet if you're going to bet. And this is a brilliant example of this in action where we're going to bet small because we expect his range to either be a king or a bluff and there's just no reason to risk extra money against the king x region. I think this hand is well played. I'm going to give this bluff a 10 out of 10 because I haven't looked at it in a solver and I don't care what the solver thinks anyway. So no one can prove me wrong. So there. Let's move on. And if you're interested in joining the next intake of the Carrot Poker School, then classes start on April 11th, the week commencing April 11th, 2022. Just get in touch via Discord, add me there. You can even Skype me if you're a boomer and you like that old sort of rubbish technology. Or you can email me via the contact link on my website if you want to enroll or even just pick my brain about which course to do or get a bit more information. All right, let's get to the last hand. So in the following spot, we face an open from the button. We go for a three bet in the big blind. My sizing is pretty large here because I'm going to be three betting a more polarized range. My sizing would be smaller a little bit in the, in the small blind where I'm using a more linear range doing less flatting. If you're wondering on the discrepancy there, if you've seen me sort of alternate sizes in the two blinds, that's why. Um, 974, I think this is a flop where big bets are going to be the preference. Again, we kind of retain a large nut advantage here. Although when we're in the big blind, we do have a few more of this like 9x, 7x type stuff that we would have in the small blind. So I wouldn't be shocked if the solver did use some small bets here, but I opted to play a big bet strategy. Big bet or check that is, and this time I rolled high. And when I roll high on my random number generator, I will be checking if the hand is a mix. Of course, some hands are not mixes. This one is mostly a bet, but I think check raise here is also good. I think when I do check this hand, I will usually raise. And I opt to do that. Just a small 3x raise here is going to be my preference on this node. Villain makes the call, and we go to the deuce of spades turn. Now there's certain hands that I feel like are way too good to sort of check fold 
but they don't do so well when they face bets and this is definitely one of them. It's not a fantastic check jam, just a gutter and two overs. It's not a very good check call either, being flimsy and frail and not really ever having any showdown value. But I think it does make a very fine bet, so I opt to just use, a, again, a smaller bet here because the SPR, the stack to pot ratio, has come down a lot from me raising flops. So when I go bigger on flop or when more money goes in on the flop, it's, there's every chance that the turn sizing will end up being smaller. It doesn't need to be as big in theory. So we go for this bet, billing calls, and the river is the deuce of hearts. Now, again, when I, I'm saying this to my students all the time, right, that when you reach a river node and you're trying to decide which are the bluffs I'm meant to give up and which are the ones I'm meant to continue. What you really want to do is focus on unblocking. In other words, not blocking your opponent's main folding range. Here I can see Villain calling me down with Jack-9, 10-9, 10s, hands like that. So we do block some calls, but on the more important point of actually unblocking his folding range, he's mainly going to be folding stuff like Ace, Queen of Spades, Ace, Jack of Spades, King, Queen of Spades, King, Jack of Spades, King, 10 of Spades, Pure, Ace, 5 of Spades, Ace, 3 of Spades. These hands, if they exist, are going to be the main hands that are folded all the time, as well as maybe some like Ace, Queen offsuit or something like that, that can call twice in this wide range of skirmish. So I think Jack, 10 being a hand with no showdown value and unblocking the folds, the club, the club hands would probably have folded on the turn. This is a hand that's frequently just going to want to, well, probably always just going to want to jam the river. We do jam the river. Do we get called yet again? Can we make it four times getting called out of four? In fact, no, sorry, we didn't get called in hand two. We actually get a fold this time. We get a bluff through, ladies and gentlemen. What a feeling. But that doesn't mean that we're out the woods. There's still time for the solver to turn around and be like, Pete, your analysis is garbage. And I've not looked at the solver yet. So let's take a look and see whether I get scolded or praised for this one. So it turns out this hand is almost always going to want to bet the flop here. It's a big bet that the solver likes to use, as we can see. And this hand is a 90% bet. For obvious reasons, no showdown value, two overs, backdoor. We don't want to be check raising as often as we're betting. We do go for a check this time. He bets small. Whenever we do that, we are going to check raise. There's not going to be any check call with this combo. So this is one of our rare check raises here. So far, so good. The turn comes down. The deuce of spades. Villain calls the raise. Deuce of spades on the turn. And yeah, we have the sort of hand that would be barreling if it was hearts. But because we're blocking back doors here that bet call, the solver is once again just like, Pete, your turn play in three bet pots is abominable. You have completely the wrong understanding about which of these hands you should be following through and which ones you should be giving up. And when you have two clubs blocking the back doors here, you are just supposed to be giving up. So again, I'm missing this in game because I'm just thinking, I don't like the feeling of checking. I don't like giving up here, but actually checking and facing a bet, I'm supposed to just take my better medicine here and just say, this hand is just not as good as I think it is. It's actually really flimsy. It's near the bottom of my range. I can just fold it. So I'm definitely being way too unselective with my aggression in three bit pots on the turn. This is a big takeaway from today. And one of the things that's really important to do, even if you consider yourself like a relatively theoretically competent player, is to be like, where's my game deficient? And I think three bit pots out of position on the turn is where I've got to do some work. So anyway, we want to go ahead and give this one up. If we had bet, I think the river analysis is probably better than the turn analysis here. Say we go for 33% pot, which is the common sizing. Deuce of hearts comes on the river. We're kind of following through with this combo, as we can see if we did have jack 10 here, that's not spades, the EV would be positive for bluffing. That's because we devoid bluffing with like queen 10 of spades, we'd bluff this hand instead. This is a positive EV bluff because it unblocks his folds. His main folds are just going to be things like, wow, look at that king jack of spades had actually calling there. That's insane. Um, that's just, that's, that's just, wow. Wow, solver, you are, you are truly a hero or an idiot or both, I don't know. But yeah, there's, there's a lot going on here that basically just shows you that when you get to the river, villain's folding range in reality might be quite different from what it actually is in theory because there's just no way people are making these calls with like busted flush draws and king queen high. So I think the jack 10 is an even better combo relative to other combos in practice than it is in theory for bluffing the river as blockers are going to be even more um, where they need to be. But yeah, the right idea again, what I've learned today is that my heart's kind of in the right place. My thought process is along the right lines on the river. 
but I am getting to rivers with the wrong combos. I am not conscious enough of just how selective I need to be out of position in these three bit pots. And I think this, having made this video, is just going to help my game tremendously and help my coaching tremendously. And, and yeah, I think it's really important to be brutally honest about the stuff that you do wrong and not just show all the stuff that works and looks amazing that Solver approved, right? Guys, if you've enjoyed this video, you know where to go. It's carrotcorner.com. You can find out about my private coaching, my poker school, and tons of other products from ranges to books to e-magazines available in the Carrot Corner Poker Store. This has been Pete Clark, and I'll be bringing you guys more YouTube content very soon. Please do smash that like button and subscribe to my channel. It helps me a lot. And don't forget to also follow me on Twitch. I will be streaming on a daily basis, Monday to Friday, usually in the daytime. Check it out there. Much love. Bye for now. Good luck at the tables.